Good afternoon. You know, if I had my wits about me whatsoever, I would uh, cede the rest of my time to both Bruce and Angela. Just extraordinary remarks, but fortunately we'll get back to them in a moment. I'm going to talk a little bit more narrowly about uh, two constructs in the life of American cities that I think have changed fundamentally in the last 25 years since this Congress assembled. Detroit and philanthropy. So let me explain. Detroit. You know, perhaps no other single place carries so many mixed messages in the parlance of urban policy and community development. From the automobile capital of the world to the birthplace of the American middle class to the embodiment of post-industrial urban disinvestment and an unprecedented public sector financial failure. All too often, Detroit is dismissed as sui generis. It's one of a kind. And I would suggest that that is way too easy a response. That in fact, it is a place with powerful lessons to impart to other American cities. Three reasons. First, it is the emblematic post-industrial North American city. Bruce articulated this powerfully. If Detroit can put in place the building blocks of innovation and reinvention, so too might the once great industrial centers of America, the Clevelands, the St. Louis's, the Buffaloes. Second, the particular challenges Detroit faces, education reform, reimagined land use, economic scarcity and polarization, and others, are manifest to varying degrees in cities well beyond the Rust Belt. As we uncrack the code in one place, we make it more likely that we can do it elsewhere. And third, to turn our backs on cities like Detroit would represent an utter failure of vision and a deep moral abdication. Detroit is home to 700,000 individuals, each one carrying a portion of Detroit's soul, past, present, and future. Its history is the history of 20th century America, its cultural institutions among the nation's treasures, its physical form and architectural legacy unique among American cities. There is a way forward. We just have to have the creativity, ingenuity, and skill to identify and follow it. So I want to couch the lessons of Detroit in terms of philanthropy's changing role there. Over the last five years, as the public sector in Detroit has been consumed with trying to balance its books, as the private sector has struggled to emerge from its defensive crouch, and as the nonprofit sector has been swamped with heightened demand for lifeline services, philanthropy has had no choice in Detroit but to step up, read from the same page, aim clearly, and get something done. Now, this is not something that comes naturally to philanthropy, given its strong predisposition to preserve its mantle of neutrality and avoiding stirring up a fuss. But as Adlai Stevenson once remarked, it's hard to lead a cavalry charge if you think you look funny on a horse. We've had to work hard in Detroit to convince ourselves that philanthropy doesn't look so funny on a horse. Foundations working in Detroit, both national and local foundations, are acknowledging that we can no longer sit at the margins, hoping that our good intentions and charitable impulses will help the community claw through tough times. Instead, we're aggressively helping shape and accelerate a very different civic trajectory. I want to suggest four ways that philanthropy has done that in Detroit, to be sure, but in other cities across America as well. First, philanthropy is helping to reset Detroit's civic vision and help broaden and align the civic alliance. I didn't realize that that was the Dolly Parton phenomenon, Bruce. That's a, that's a terrific metaphor. Not sure I understand it, but I, I like it. Um, it is really difficult to overstate how debilitating the absence of shared community vision has been in Detroit. We knew what we used to stand for, and we, were f and we frequently reached back reflexively to that identity as a substitute for vision. But it is an entirely inadequate substitute. The world around us has changed in such fundamental ways that Detroit has no choice but to reinvent itself and its place in the world. Philanthropy in Detroit has made it possible for that to happen. You know, in those vast stretches of abandonment that are so familiar from the nation's media photo essays, Detroit has more public open space than any American city the equivalent of 40 square miles, or the size of the city of San Francisco. Waves of plant closings have vacated hundreds of acres of land at a time, and less than hardy wood frame structures have deteriorated like houses of cards, leaving the city with some 80,000 vacant homes or abandoned parcels. 
it is more space, far more space, than traditional planning and development constructs can handle. More space than a municipality can manage through its normal tendency to spread services in equal portions across its land mass. In a word, Detroit's geography dwarfs its governance machinery. It simply has to repurpose its underutilized land in order to survive, stabilize, and grow. We faced this head-on through a three-year process that blended high-level planning and technical analysis led by Tony Griffin with intensive local citizen engagement. The result is the Detroit Future City Plan that was referenced earlier this morning. It's a decision-making and investment framework rooted in what I call a syncopation strategy, emphasizing the strong beats by reinforcing nodes of commercial and residential strength, while giving equal attention to the weak beats by shifting vacant and underutilized land from the debit side of the ledger to the asset side through strategies such as blue-green infrastructure, urban farming, transit connectivity, and others. The plan's governance structure makes the entire community the steward of the framework, housing the framework outside the governmental sector. It will be animated by a detailed investment plan, jump-started by our foundation's commitment to invest $150 million over the next five years in the plan's implementation. The second role philanthropy is playing in Detroit is aggregating discretionary capital to incur early-stage development costs that have limited return potential. The philanthropic community in Detroit has moved beyond responsive charitable grant making by deploying large pools of capital that birth the information, relationships, and early stage project architecture that enable the community to confront challenges that no single foundation alone could take on. Stated differently, we're erecting the scaffolding that will enable us to stabilize and strengthen until the public and the private sectors can re-enter the equation. An illustration is the Detroit Foundation community's decision to foster an entrepreneurial ecosystem, something alien to the traditional command and control automobile economy. Almost six years ago, 10 foundations stepped outside their traditional funding areas and committed more than $100 million to create a fund to grow the infrastructure that entrepreneurs need in order to get started and to grow. It has been stunningly successful. We've capitalized a pre-sea venture fund, created two small business incubators and a green economy nonprofit research and development organization, established a medical devices innovation center, and enhanced Wayne State University's technology transfer operations. These efforts have injected into the Detroit economic landscape a nimbleness and rapid response capacity that has been notably absent for decades. The third role philanthropy is playing in Detroit is serving as a guarantor of value. You know, aggregation of capital can only take a city so far. We've recognized in Detroit that philanthropy also has to find ways to open the spigots of private capital. The problem is the perception on the part of lenders and investors that the most elementary financial equation simply doesn't hold in Detroit. Returns are insufficient to justify the perceived risk, particularly in real estate where there's little underlying equity and collateral values are depressed. There's no simple antidote to this situation, but starting three years ago, philanthropy took two steps to remove some of the risk and jumpstart the private capital markets in one area of the city, Midtown, where there was a heightened potential for market growth. As Bruce mentioned, Midtown is the home to some of the city's most stable and healthy institutions, to educational institutions, to large hospitals, a dozen of the city's cultural anchors, a half a dozen performing, high-performing high schools, and many others. The first step was to attract to Detroit a new initiative from something called Living Cities, a consortium of the nation's largest foundations and banks, in which $25 million of senior debt, below market philanthropic loans and grants would be committed to Midtown and the surrounding very impoverished neighborhood. Not only is that a remarkable figure, but it also dramatically bolstered the capacity of the city's leading community development organization and has attracted the city's first national community development finance institution, providing desperately needed community-based lending capacity and expertise. The second step was Kresge's creation, together with five contributing bank partners, of a $30 million residential real estate fund to close the remaining gaps on more than a dozen transformative real estate projects in Midtown. 
These actions to guarantee value for the private markets are beginning to bear fruit. Residential occupancy rates in Midtown are approaching 100%, putting upward pressure on rent and purchase prices and making the financing of residential projects more tenable. Whole Foods just opened a store in the heart of Midtown. It's first in the city, and its numbers are astronomical. I just talked to the, the founder of Whole Foods, and he told me that in the first month it broke every record um, of any Whole Foods store in America. Um, scores of retail stores and restaurants have appeared in the last three years. In a word, philanthropy's investments and activities have sent a strong and clear signal to the market that there will be stable value over time, creating a willingness to invest. The fourth role philanthropy is playing is functioning as a seller, not as a buyer, particularly in drawing national resources to Detroit. Philanthropy's commitment to Detroit has taken us out of the comfortable philanthropic default of, in effect, being exclusively a buyer of nonprofit services, waiting for organizations to present a suitable set of opportunities for our investment. We do, of course, welcome exactly those opportunities when they emerge, but we've also had to be more proactive, functioning, in effect, as a seller, helping bring others to the table to get projects done. And our buyers are multifold. First, there is the national philanthropic community. It's impossible to overstate, for example, the importance of the Ford Foundation's commitment, not only to moving dollars into Detroit, but also to applying lessons from its national programming to the Detroit circumstance. Our second group of buyers is the private sector. Kresge's not the Chamber of Commerce, but we're happy to play the role of Sherpas for anyone with a serious interest in investing in the city. We'll unpack the investment context for them, explaining what's happening on the ground, and how we expect to, things to play out over the next number of years. Our third group of buyers, if I may be so bold, is the federal government. Detroit philanthropy has helped the Obama administration find an on-ramp to Detroit. The president and his colleagues have made clear that they want to assist in Detroit's renewal and have turned to philanthropy to figure out just how to do that. Just three weeks ago, for example, four cabinet officials traveled to Detroit to announce a joint federal government philanthropic, philanthropic commitment of $300 million to address blight and land reclamation, public safety, and transportation. I want to spend just a moment with that last piece, transportation, as an illustration of just how important this philanthropic selling function can be. Because if there was ever an environment that was toxic to public transport and mass transit, it's been Detroit and its surrounding communities. Four years ago, Kresge committed $35 million, conditioned on the private, institutional, and public sectors matching that figure, to the construction of a streetcar line along Woodward Avenue for three reasons. First, it would help create new connections all up and down Woodward, the region's commercial, cultural, medical, and educational spinal cord. Second, it would encourage dense patterns of land use, such as housing, retail, and other amenities, to begin to populate areas within walking distance of the stops. And third, it would create the first leg of a regional transportation system that would extend in subsequent phases to the job centers to the northern suburbs and connect to the high-speed rail line coming from Chicago and running through Ann Arbor. You know, it seemed like a pretty straightforward position, uh, proposition. Philanthropy and the private sector funding to create a public good. <laughs> Not. <laughs> it turned out to be an indescribably complex set of setbacks and lurches forward that at various times put the project at odds with the city of Detroit, the state of Michigan, the United States Department of Transportation, and the Federal Transit Administration. But the private philanthropic consortium held, call, calling on every piece of political, financial, and personal capital it possessed to navigate the project to final approval, which was granted earlier this year. We had to raise another $40 million of capital, bringing our total commitment to $140 million, we had to pass eight bills through the Michigan legislature, which hadn't happened in the history of that state. We had to solve scores of gnarly engineering and infrastructure issues. Distilled to its essence, it was an act of selling. To the governor, that the project should jumpstart a regional transportation system. To the mayor, that the city should permit a private consortium to take the lead. And most importantly, to the secretary of transportation, that the project was a path-breaking, innovative approach to federal, private, philanthropic transportation partnerships. And we intend to break ground in the next two months. 
I believe that these four lessons about philanthropic role that can be excavated from Detroit, realigning the civic vision, providing early stage scaffolding, serving as a guarantor of value, and behaving like a seller, have enormal, enormous salience to other cities in America. Perhaps not through the investments of the kind or at the scale I've described, and perhaps not in the context of such extreme duress. But in their essential, in their essential form and purpose, I think they hold. Civil society mobilizing in concerted action to change the trajectory of communities too important to fail. Thanks very much.